Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Today we are at the Bisbee Mining and Historical Museum and we're gonna go see what's going on. Now we've been to many mining museums before so some of these things are gonna look a little familiar but these are specific to the Bisbee area. So right through these doors we're about to go and have some fun. Okay, adventurers, we are inside of the museum here. Now, the museum closes at four today, so we're getting in a little bit later in the day. So we're gonna make this a faster tour than normal. However, tons of cool information and definitely something you're gonna wanna see if you come to the Bisbee area. Now, a few things you'll need to know. Adult admission is only $8. Masks are currently required. I am here in late April and it's still a requirement. Respect the uh, the community. It's not everywhere that you're being asked to wear a mask, but do bring one with you just in case. Now, let's go through some of these different displays, find out a little bit of the history, and see how it ties back to our other experience we did here in Bisbee on another video where we went through the copper mine tour. Now, in this room right here, we actually have a huge mineral collection that we're definitely going to have to check out. But first, let's get a little bit of context as to what all is in here by going through the halls of the museum. And in order to do that, let's first say, why did Bisbee come to be? It was remote, it didn't have fertile land, but did you know that copper was king here? In fact, this is what made the city of Bisbee really come to life. And at one point in time, you could look over here and see just how packed Bisbee would have actually been. Look at all those people, this is insane, this is so crazy. And this is the very building that we're actually standing in right now. This is really, really neat. Now, throughout the museum, you'll find a series of different boards of history telling you a little bit more about the different things that happened. One of the factors in the settling stages of this particular area was the confrontations that they were having with the Apaches. That actually ended. Copper prices were on the uptick and the railroad lines were extended west, making it a much easier place to navigate around. Now, this is what Bisbee might have looked like at that time. Look at this, this is bustling, this is thriving. This is so busy. Now, as people came to the area for the copper, copper was, again, on the uptick. Now, what does that mean? Copper was being used for so many more things. And so they needed it more and more and more to produce lots of different stuff. And in fact, right down here, there's a few of those things that they might have used copper for. Now, remember, at that time, people were moving in and they were making about $3 a day in the mines. And then they would get bonus structure for if they were able to pull out more. So the rise was going up, the people were working hard, and everything seemed really great for Bisbee at that time. And as we progress, you'll see a little bit more. We just talked about how the railroads were coming into the area, and as you can see, the railroads are indicated by three separate colors here. The initial railroads of 1861 were in yellow, 1881 in blue, and 1903 in Bisbee. So you can see right here on the map is Bisbee, and the blue and the red both start to come into play. So 1881 and 1903, railroad lines were run through this area. Pretty interesting, in 1892, the value of copper, silver, and gold were right here. So, in the amount shown, these metals right here. Here you go, this one, this one, and this one. Each of these were worth about $20. So, you would have to have 170 pounds of this one right here to equal the same as one gold coin. Now, something we've learned time and time again when we come to a historic site that involves mining is once someone started to strike it rich, corporations started moving in into the area and really flooding it. So this area right here talks a little bit more about the overall operations and there's some fascinating things inside this little case right here that I'm about to show you. It's really interesting to see how each site ties together. And some of these things are familiar while some of them, because it's Bisbee, are a bit unique. Thank you. 
Now, when you come to Bisbee, you'll notice that there are several outlying areas from the historic downtown. Much like normal communities in more modern days, people had really flooded the downtown area and expanded upon it, and it became very congested and almost a little claustrophobic. So subdivisions and suburbs started to pop up, and around this area now, you'll find several of those where there's still some really cool stuff. This particular display right here talks about that movement and how it happened and that people who could afford to do so would just scoop up a little piece of land, call it theirs, and then it would suddenly be this brand new little subdivision of happiness. So let me show you like kind of what some of these little town site areas would have looked like and then also how they might have moved around a little bit right here. In fact, this is one of the railway cards right here, the passes. And then you can see on this map right here where some of those little subdivisions might have been. Now we are here in Bisbee. I have been out to the Lowell area. That's where they have all of the really cool historic cars and also the Bisbee Breakfast Club. And then as you kind of go around, you can find the other areas right around this area. This is all within very short drive from the historic downtown. Now, trolleys and public transportation were king at that time, so that people didn't have to individually walk from their subdivision or have a car that they would then have to figure out where to park. So trolleys were a really big part of Bisbee, and that's part of Bisbee that has kind of faded off into the distance, and it's kind of sad to see. But with progress, with growth, also comes change. And so now, here in 2022, unfortunately, that is an aspect that we no longer can see around town. Now within progress, there is always problem. And here you can see not only flooding, but fire that have struck this area. It says here that because of the rapid growth, about 20% in 1860 and about 40% from 1910 and 50% in the 1920s, the rapid unplanned growth led to overcrowding and a lot of problems, including lawlessness, which contributed to some of this. But they had to figure out something to do to alleviate this infrastructure problem. And so as they did, they created a series of other things and city improvements to really shape the town and move it forward into what we now would know Bisbee to be. In fact, many of the buildings that we're seeing now have very interesting improvements which have been made to increase the longevity of the building structures. In addition to that, schools were built and the first public library. That's just awesome because you can still come here and see a very unique and amazing library structure here in Bisbee. But there's more. They had a mercantile which went up at the Copper Queen. And then right here, you can even see the first hospital that was constructed here in Bisbee. If there's one thing I can tell you about Bisbee is that every single building has some kind of unique garnish on it. And this actually started around the same time. In fact, between 1905 and 1906, projects like this began to take place, really improving the overall appearance of the mountain town. It was also around this time that merchants really took over and took to the streets. And here you can see what that might have looked like with all of those signs. Now there's a lot of signs still here in Bisbee, but of course they have been changed up just a bit from what this looked like with the modernization of the roads and then also adding the sidewalks for a little bit safer navigation. These are some of the products that you might have found though at some of those local merchants at the time. Another super interesting fact about Bisbee, which I feel still echoes how they kind of are today, immigration. Immigration was huge here. In fact, almost one third of the population at one point in time was considered to be an immigrant. And that's out of 9,000 people. That was huge. So today I feel as though Bisbee is still that accepting fun place where you see tons of different groups of people coming in here and feeling very welcomed. Everything that I have done here, I've had someone who's been friendly around every corner who's been a resident and I would like to say that it stems back to this now there is an entire section here about the interesting flavor of the community and why you'll find so many interesting things even in Bisbee now but definitely come through and check this out this is fascinating Of 
course we know mining was huge here from all the context that we've already received. But what did that look like for the average person? Well, we found out a little bit more about this on the tour at the mine. Check that video out for sure. But look at this. This tells us a little bit more about what those conditions might have looked like. Now again, as we take a tour through this museum, it talks all about community and I love that. Here we have a participating in a community life board. It shows you some of the different sporting events, some of the different theatrical productions, some of the cool stuff that they used to do here in Bisbee. It's fascinating. It's super fun to see how this community not only started out, came together, but also remains intact as a result today. Very, very cool stuff here. Like this right here, they actually had a Bisbee bowling team. That's kind of fun because they still have a bowling event here at one of the local establishments, which is kind of neat. This is the community coming together for the 1913 record-breaking rock drilling contest. Early women were also represented. This is a women's golfer group taking a break at the Warren District Country Club around 1910. And then right here we have Max Ashby and a companion astride a pushmobile in 1913. Now, if you go around town, you'll see that they actually have some soapbox derby cars around here too, which is kind of cool. Now, of course, like most towns that were around this kind of industry, they've had some ups and downs. Mining is a very, very fickle thing. In fact, as you can see through here, there's a whole section not only talking about the struggles that they would have to go through as a result of the mines, but also of some of the changes that were coming in this country. Here, we have a bunch of women who are marching. In fact, in this section, we talk a little bit more about the progressive era in general and how there were a lot of problems that were coming up, like child labor and women's suffrage and poor working conditions for others. And so there were a lot of different things that people right here in Bisbee started to take into account and make a stand against. And by doing so, they held a strong, strong understanding that reform had to come. Amongst those, they started deporting strikers from Bisbee. In fact, at one point in time, all of these people, all of these 1,200 deportees were assembled at a U.S. Army base and held in Columbus, New Mexico. Now standing up for their rights, standing up for what they believed in, standing up for fair wages, these were all things that they were protesting about. And you can see on this short film just a little bit more about that. But again, they just scooped them all up and decided they were going to get rid of them. What? Okay, after learning a little bit more about that, we're going to make sure we sneak up here to the gym room really quickly because we're almost to close. And I have to show you something. I have to show you something. This is a little Minerals and Me place. Now, this is very similar to what they have at the Miners Hall of Fame. But, check this out. Aren't these all beautiful? Absolutely beautiful. But what makes them even more beautiful is look at all of this. All of these questions are things you should be asking yourself. Did you know that fluoride recovered from fluorite is actually in toothpaste? What? Did you know that fluoride is also used instead of glass in telescopes, microscopes, and camera lenses? It's always fascinating to me whenever we find these kind of displays because very common things that we use every single day, we take for granted. We don't realize that there is a whole process to be able to find these and efficiently use them in a safe way, just so that we can have regular things. So I always appreciate these little displays a little bit more. But inside this room right here, something even more cool. It's here that we're asked to evaluate our own footprint when it comes to copper consumption. Because of course, copper is king here in the Bisbee area. So all of these things that we're seeing on this wall right here all use copper. Do you use any of these? 
Um, I use several of those. I'm just gonna let you know. I use several of these, which means that my copper footprint is pretty big. It's pretty decent. Now, as though that wasn't enough copper consumption, well, in the 80s, computers came along and they really needed a lot of copper. And so copper production went up, up, up. And whenever it did, everything was great until it wasn't. At one point in time, everything started to make a shift. And whenever it did, the copper industry here in Bisbee kind of petered out. And in fact, our mining tour guide told us that at one point in time, he came to work and was offered a slip of paper and told, sorry, see you next time. And that was it. Now leading up to computers, however, a lot of other things continue to up the ante for needing copper. All those things on the wall that we saw are things that currently use copper, but did you know that things as they continued to be developed more and more relied heavily on this for example in the 1920s the demand went up because they needed to be able to make radios in the 1870s they needed more because guess what we needed light bulbs and in 1870s we needed telephones so of course we needed more copper Now again guys, this is just a super brief tour through this museum because there is a lot of stuff here that is amazing. Now I'm able to visually see it, take it in, and help you guys understand a little bit of the story here, but you're going to have to come and visit. It is absolutely fabulous. And I would definitely say that this section right here definitely compares to the Miners Hall of Fame area. So well done, the visuals are beautiful, and the minerals Oh my goodness, guys, the minerals are so pretty. The camera doesn't even do them justice. So definitely come and check it out. But I'm gonna go back downstairs and uh, check out one last thing before we head out. Just past the gift shop is the Founders Room. And this is one that has a really cool other video playing right over here that you can check out. But there's also some additional information in here. Now all of the woodwork is the same thing that would have been here whenever this was being used. So it's really nice to like step back in time and just breathe in this room and think of all of the things that might have happened here. I love to do that when we go to historic sites. So I think that's what I'm gonna do, just take it in and show you a few of the details.
Okay, as you can see, that founder's room was beautiful. And at the end there, I just wanted to tie in a few of the fun things that you could find in the visitor center here at the museum. It's a gorgeous place to stop in, learn a little bit about the area, and then also to get that historic reference kind of under your belt before you tackle the rest of the town. There's tons of cool stuff to do here. It'll keep you super busy and you'll love every minute of it. Thank you guys for coming along. Remember, we are not here for a long time, but we are here for a good time. Sometimes getting brain wrinkles is the best time. Till next time, guys. Bye.